What's up, Cool Biders? In today's episode, we welcome to the show Vanessa Alfaro, the CEO and managing partner of Venus Capital Partners, a multifamily syndication group with over six hundred units under management. Vanessa is a very successful entrepreneur, having founded five businesses exceeding the seven-figure revenue mark. And despite the massive success that she's had in the business world, we talk about how at the beginning of her career, she had a ton of limiting beliefs coming into the real estate investing space. And she shares in this episode how she overcame some of those initial limiting beliefs when she started her real estate investing journey. Later on in the episode, Vanessa touches on the AI revolution and how real estate investors and syndicators alike can leverage AI technology to skyrocket their investing business in 2024 and beyond. And finally, we end the episode by talking about the next 24 months and why this is the most important 24 month stretch in the last decade for commercial real estate investors and especially, Vanessa adds, for multifamily investors. Lots of gems being shared in this one, everyone. So let's welcome to the show, Vanessa Alfaro. Vanessa, welcome to the Gold Knife. Thank you, Danny. Yeah. Happy to be here. We were having a great time just now working through some technical difficulties and talking about our Latin heritage. So really cool that I get to uh, talk to a fellow Latin investor. It's not every day, you know, that I get to do this. So this is going to be a really, really fun episode. You started off by managing a marketing agency. And you made that pivot right. into real estate investing and syndication. So I'd really love to hear because this is not every day that I talked to someone that was in marketing before and then made the switch into real estate investing and syndication. So what inspired that career pivot? Oh, interesting. Uh, I think that a lot of people actually switch careers it- okay, and pivot to real estate. Uh, you can see these in like doctors and nurses and there's so many doctors going into real estate. Uh, and it's, it's very scary for most of us that are not into real estate, hasn't grown in a family that have real estate and own single family homes or multifamily and all these things. So um, it was very scary for me. Okay, uh, Probably people can relate that actually is switching careers into real estate. Uh, because I didn't know anything about multifamily industry. I knew about marketing. I, I had four businesses before actually having my uh, private equity firm company. So I knew how to create a business from zero. I knew how to start a business, but all the business were actually really okay, kind of same feel. I had a marketing company in Venezuela when I was um, actually from, and then I had another marketing company in Panama and a trade show company. And then my husband and I opened a production company, which I was working with him on how to create the business and in some marketing as well. So, and one way or the, the other, it was all related, but it was the first time for me that I was going into the unknown. So um, it was a scary move actually to do. Yeah. Uh, it, it takes a, like a leap of blind faith that you can, you know, make it work. But the fact that you had had other businesses too, I mean, I, I, I also made a pivot into, uh, you know, hotel investing. And so when I, when I made that pivot, yeah, there was, there was a degree of uncertainty, but like you said, you had already done it before you had built a business before. So you know what that felt like. And I think that that really helps because if you don't know what that feels like, I feel like I, I don't know if you would succeed, you know, if this was like your first go at, at something, because it really takes a lot of work. Uh, I'm curious, you know, what some of the- A lot of work. Yeah, what, what some of the challenges were, you know, when you started, like, what can you remember when you, when you, um, when you were first kind of getting into it? What, what were some of the challenges that you had to overcome? Well, the first challenge was to go into something that you don't know, like a hundred percent don't know. And I remember having this conversation with my husband, hey, we should go into multifamily. And I was like, I literally know zero about multifamily. I had some real estate investments in Panama, like single family homes. And it was like literally a nightmare for me to deal with tenants. <laughs> and I 
I don't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be dealing with tenants, the people that pay, that they pay, blah, blah, blah. So for me, the first step was to understand what I was getting into it. So the first step was to know, okay, I need to learn what is, what, what is all this business about? And I need to learn um, how you can put this business together. I can do a business plan, but I have no, I, I don't know anything about the industry. So my first step was actually to go into a multifamily conference, which I didn't know I wanted to be multifamily. I wanted to do multifamily. I knew I wanted to do real estate, but no multifamily. So I actually did some research into Philippines and hotels and different asset classes. And one reason or the other, I ended going into a two hours conference about multifamily. And I was like, this is it. This is exactly what I need. This is exactly how I can learn. And they gave me so much information. It was one of these two hours event that you ended um, buying the whole coaching program. This is, this is. <laughs> if you relate to that. Uh, so, but they gave me so much information. I was like, this is incredible. Uh, they must be so much more that I can learn. So that was my first step um, into into multifamily. I remember I pay fifteen hundred dollars <laughs> to sign up for the next level of the event, and it was a three days event. You learn about how to own the right properties. And since I really love numbers, okay, I love numbers. I, I love Excel tables. Uh, I mean, like I can immerse myself in Excel all day and I will be super happy doing that. Sure. So it was me three day. Like I was learning, I was using Excel, doing projections. I was very familiar to PL, balance sheet and all that because of my business. Uh, and then after that I actually signed up for the full yearly um coaching of the program and that's how it there's a yeah there's a lot there and and the first question i want to ask you is the one that came to mind first was with the tenants thing so with the investment properties that you had overseas you said like one of the biggest nightmares that you had was dealing with tenants i find it interesting that you still chose to invest into an asset class that you have to deal with tenants all day right so what were the differences right between the tenants and was it like mostly single family homes or single residences overseas? Okay, gotcha. So what were some yes. of the differences in dealing with tenants in single family residences versus like uh, tenants in a multifamily complex? Like what were what were the, the differences there for you? Well, have you ever been, or you are your, the, the listeners actually, mm -hmm. have you ever been in a situation that you feel that you should be in real estate and you want to buy something real estate. That's everybody says real estate is amazing and it's going to give you cash flow. And then all of the sudden people start throwing on you deals that are amazing because the building is pretty and it, it <laughs> looks like super luxury. And you're going to have, you're going to make a lot of money because the price is right. And then you go and you buy that property and you realize that nothing is real because <laughs> you're not making money. Uh, you actually pay overpriced and then you buy it and buy it and buy it and then you don't know how. And then probably you should write in them because you don't know how to screen that person. That's exactly what happened to me. Uh -huh. um, I went into the unknown and I got a few apartments in a luxury um, tower. Uh, house. Uh, and I actually didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I had my marketing business that I was making money and I wanted to invest that money in, in a different way. That was not the regular investments that I had. And, and I followed that trend. Uh, but in reality is that there is way more <laughs> than just buying a pretty building. Okay. And just putting, putting a tenant. So, um, uh, I learned okay, by experience. And then when I wanted to really make a business of this, uh, I, I decided I definitely need the education because I know how things can go wrong. And these things are going, went wrong with my money. Okay. I didn't lose any money because I sold my properties overseas, but, um, 
the year, uh, I don't know, the two years experience was really, really a nightmare and I didn't make any money. Uh, but if you're going into this business, uh, you're not using only your money, you're using other people's money. So you have to make sure that you have uh, the the knowledge, mm -hmm. okay? And you have people also with you that has experience to guide you in some of the challenge that you may have. Yeah, it's, Does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. That that that's interesting. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I uh, I used to be a, a broker back in the day, and and the uh, the thing I always just tell my clients is, hey, do you want to be sexy or do you want to be rich? Right? Because the 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 investment properties that look nice, the ones that are in these like super affluent areas, they're usually way overpriced, and you're not going to make any money on them. And so it's uh, it's interesting that you also learn that lesson and. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you said that to your clients yeah. because you usually brokers won't say that to you. Yeah. <laughs> they just sell you what they think that you, what they have, like yep. they sell what they have in their pocket. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's the difference between being transactional versus being relationship based, right? So if you're just trying to get the deal done, then you're going to obviously just try and fit them into whatever you can get them into and then like get out of there, collect your commission. But I never really believed in that because I, I knew that I was building a, a, a business and that referrals and word of mouth and everything were going to go a long way. And so I think that that, um, and some of it was just knowledge based. Too. I don't know if I would share, I don't know if I would share a broker like you, if I find a broker like you that is actually giving me the best investment properties, I don't know if I would share that with other people. I will keep you for me. Oh yeah. <laughs> only, and I will buy all your properties. Well, I was, I, I was in residential. <laughs> Just for myself. I was in residential. So slightly different, you know, cause <laughs> you, you have, you have the families and the, you know, the, the single family homes and stuff. Wow. So yeah. That's a good business yeah. model. That's yeah. true. Yeah. A hundred percent. But I agree with you. If you find a good broker um, and they're feeding you good deals in commercial, uh, those those aren't brokers that you typically share, you know. <laughs> those are definitely not brokers. I love typically. my brokers. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I love my brokers. They are my friends. Most of them become my friends. Yeah. After we have um, one deal that we close, uh, we talk often. Uh, it's it's good to have. It's important to create that relationship. Yep. With the brokers, uh, because I, and I do have brokers that I buy from. And I do have brokers that sell my properties. Uh, and usually they are different brokers, uh, two different pile of brokers. Sure. And they know that I buy from them and then they sell for me. Okay. Uh, yeah. Usually they are not the same, if you know what I mean, because uh, I want to make sure that I buy at the best price. I want to make sure that they sell at the best price. And uh, they're usually two different type of brokers. It's a different skill set for sure. Um, I would agree a hundred percent. And it's, it's hard to find someone that that's, that does both or that's really, really good at both. I've, I've found a few, but I, I, I hear you, you know, not everyone's going to be great at, at everything. And I'm really curious since we're on this subject, how, when you first started Vanessa, how did you build those relationships? Because I've found the broker relationships that I've created to be very fruitful in terms of like deal flow. But I'm really curious how you went about like sourcing the brokers and how you started building those relationships. Right. Um, when when you start in this business, most of the your biggest concern is how to find brokers because you're trying to find a deal. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of my biggest fear was actually doctors. because, as uh. you know, I have a very strong accent and I was already. Uh, I've been here in the U.S. more than 10 years, more than a decade. Yeah. But at that point, I was working, building my husband's company, and it's right now our uh, production company. And our production company is actually focused on the Hispanic market. So if I was talking in English to some people, mostly I was speaking Spanish to everybody in the company. We have people in Mexico, we have people in the U.S., but everybody was actually speaking Spanish. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was one of my biggest fear was actually to talk to brokers and start that relationship and actually talk to brokers in English. I felt like it was going to be uh, like a big barrier to start talking to people in in in, in English. Uh, 
But listen, you do what you have to do. If you're an entrepreneur, you are um, used to risk, okay? And just to take massive action. So you do what you have to do. And I started practicing. I started calling brokers. Some of them never returned my call. Uh, and I think that the smallest firms were the ones that actually were paying attention to mm-hmm. me. Like there were smallest firms in Craigslist on LoopNet or in the biggest firms, the, the new ones, the youngest ones. So those are, the, those were the ones that I was actually reaching more because the more seasonal and the more experienced one, they were not paying attention to me at all. I was new. Um, I mean, I didn't have a, a, a big portfolio to share. And one actually, one broker, very nice guy, super John, probably he was like 23 or 24. He had a lot of years uh, experience in real estate because his family was in real estate for years. Uh, but he was actually new in the firm. It was a huge firm. And I was uh, focused in the Midwest market. And I was trying to buy something from him. It was only, it was over, overpriced, 200 units. And he came back to me and said, Hey, I know you're not going to buy this, but I have a friend that has a property in Texas. You want to look at that property? And I was like, of course, yes. And he actually in contact with his friend that actually was about to put a, a property in the market in Texas. And I was not looking into Texas. Ugh. I can tell you that. And he threw me this property uh, in a very good tertiary market. In Texas. And that's, that's how I got actually into Texas because this, this was better. That's this a- interesting. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and, by the way, I would, I would absolutely agree with you that when you are getting started as an investor, those those conversations can be intimidating. You know, I, I think that given my background, I didn't have a problem with that necessarily. But I was a part of a mastermind where a lot of people like that was a huge limiting belief for them. Like, hey, like I'm I'm not experienced, or you know, whatever excuse or, or, or limiting belief of the day, you know, it's like Baskin Robbins, right? 31 flavors. There's always going to be some sort of like inner dialogue as to why they're not going to take you seriously. And I actually had a guest on the show recently, Tate Seamer, who uh, I'm not sure if you know Tate, but he's uh, in the same space, multifamily, um, runs a private equity group. And he has this, um, he calls it a credibility kit. And I thought this was really interesting, you know, um, where, you know, his student, because he runs a coaching program and everything, and his students, like, basically, um, what they did, what he did was he he put all of his uh, buildings on a, like, on a deck and had the students share, you know, as if it was, it were their buildings, right? So, like, um, so having something to share, like, having some sort of, like, credibility, he calls it a credibility kit, but... um, I think what that does, right, is it gives you as a newbie the confidence to go in and kind of like have those conversations. But I think anyone who's listening at home. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And and I think anyone that's listening at home, find your version of a credibility kit, like um, find someone to latch on to, find a mentor, find someone that has experience. Because you've talked about this too, right, Vanessa? Um, finding that mentor and 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 you know, allowing uh, someone to kind of show you the rope. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what was that experience like for you in finding a mentor and, and how did you yeah, do that? And, and I, I, and I do exactly the same uh, with my students uh, and, and the people that I coach, yeah. I do exactly the same. And we do sponsor some deals. So if, if someone new comes to us, with a deal that is a good deal and fit our criteria. So they are, they have our permission to go to that rocker and say that they are working with Venus Capital and use our schedule of real estate and actually present that as part of the group because it's true. That's if awesome. I'm going to go with them in this deal, okay, it's going to be my experience. It's going to be my portfolio, which is backing that person up. 
So that's very important if you're new is to find that um, experience. So that partner, okay, that JB partner that can actually help you to get into that closing line so you can have at least one property under your belt. So that's exactly what I did as well. Uh, I have, I had a mentor. I had a mentor for a year. Uh, this property came in the ninth month of the coaching program. Okay. Uh, so with my coach, I say, Hey, I have this property. I really need a good partner that you think is going to help me to bring this to the, to the finish line and help me and guide me to the unknown. And she put me in contact with, uh, one or two guys in the network and he was very useful okay he was very useful. i did the work okay a hundred percent work but when i need him i would text him and i would call him and he will give me the answer of how will, he will guide me on how to do even when we were in best of finals as well so that's uh i i really appreciate the, the help and the guidance that i had with him during the whole process so I do exactly the same uh, with my uh, with my students or if we're sponsoring deals, I do exactly the same with the people because I think that that's how they're going to learn. And I try not to hold anything bad. I mean, I try if I have to, probably it's like a fire hose of information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think that I share too much, uh, but I'd rather to share too much and not that you come to me and say, hey, you why you didn't tell me or you didn't you know advise me about this uh that this could be a risk or or a problem so it's it's very important if you're starting in the business you have that it's going to give you also certainty for you as you said to your limited belief it's going to give you some certainty that even if you don't know every step on the way you have someone that actually has been there uh, for the last five to 10 years. Uh, and he gave me, I didn't have that, uh, JB partner when I actually found this deal, but I had my coach, I had my coach and this is funny. Okay. But I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a golden nugget right Do now. It. So if you're really, really new, if you're like super new, and you don't know how to answer some questions in your turn, questions that you don't know. Um, just at that, in that time, five years ago, I, I was using Google. Yeah. So I will have Google in front of me all the time, just in case they ask me a question that I didn't know how to use, how to answer. But right now you can use AI. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one of the AIs open in front of you. And if they ask you a question that you don't know how to answer, just add that question to AI, like in real time, you're going to have an idea of, of what to say. A, and a, so that's, that's what I did. That is, that is awesome. Um, and actually I want to talk about AI because I know that you, um, have recently been talking uh, about AI and, and how it's revolutionizing, uh, revolutionizing the, the investing space and the syndication space. And, and, and we'll get there in a second. I do want to kind of just jump in there and, and, and reinforce what you just said about, you know, giving you the, the certainty, right? Like a, a great mentor kind of gives you that certainty. And one thing that my, one of my business coaches, uh, great guy, John, he, um, he had this saying, and I think it's really important for people to understand that great coaches and great mentors can instill what he called a borrowed belief, right? So you, they have already done it. And so because they've done it, you can borrow the, that inner belief that they have in themselves that it's going to get done. Right. And so it's so, so like that certainty that you talked about, like it, that, that you're borrowing their certainty, right? You're taking from them, they're borrowing 100%. it. And, um, and it's so powerful. And I think anyone that gets into investing or gets into anything really in the real estate space without proper coaching and proper mentorship and proper guidance, you're really setting yourself up for failure. 100%. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. And let me add one sherry on top Please. to what you're saying, which is, it's 
very important that when you're choosing a mentor, you choose a mentor that when already did and achieved what you are looking for. Mm. I mean, if, if you're looking for someone to mentor you in multifamily, well, you have to choose someone that already did and achieved what you are going through. No, a new person that probably has one property and is going to show you how to raise $20 million, but he or she herself hasn't raised even $3 million. So it's very important that when you're looking for high performance coaches, okay, you actually look for the right person that has already been there uh. okay, and has experience for you. That's what you're paying. You're paying thousands of dollars to a coach. Why? Because you want to use 10 years of experience that they have and they want to bring it to you now. So you want to save time. You want to do what, what I call a quantum uh, jump. Okay. So you do a quantum jump, jump, because you save 10 years of experience and you pay this money and the experience come to you right now, uh -huh. okay? So you don't have to go through that. So make sure it's the right coach that he's already went through that and he's already made it. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. I mean, honestly, everything that you just said, <laughs> like if you're listening to this and you're new to investing and you know, just like go rewind, you know, like the little rewind sound, you know, uh, and- Yeah, the best money that you can spend is like, how much would you pay if you save 10 years of your life and learning? How much would you pay if if someone comes to you and tells you, okay, this is what you need to know. I'm going to show you in six months exactly what you need to learn uh -huh. instead of going four years of, of college. And I, I am 100% pro college. I want all my kids to oh, go really? to college because I think <laughs> it's part of the experience. Fair enough. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Fair okay? enough. But I also want them to be entrepreneurs. And what, what they teach you in college is probably not exactly what you need to make a business. So how much would you pay instead of like studying for five years, you get that information and that experience in, in six months of, of your life. That's priceless. So I believe that education, you pay for education in one way or the other. Yes, you pay for education with money or you pay for education with experience and pain and I did both sure. I pay for education with money and pain when I got my three single family rentals okay, that was painful it cost me money and it cost me time and I was like the end I'm going to make the same mistake I'm going to pay for the education and then it took me probably nine months okay of great education, great coaching, and then I got 150 apartments okay, that make so much money for me, but for my investors, we actually ended uh, giving the investors 30% annualized rate of return wow. for four years or three years of, of holding. So they doubled their money, okay? We actually spent it for seven years, we did it in three, okay? And it was just because of education. So I think that that's the best money that you can invest, hundred percent. I uh, I absolutely love that. And in the back of my head, though, I'm thinking there's got to be someone on this call that is hearing you, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, I would love if I could pay for a great." Like, in fact, I know of a great coach, and I would love to be able to pay for that program, but I don't have the money right now. So. What would you say to someone that wants, is open to the coaching, is open to the mentorship, but does, doesn't necessarily have the bankroll to do that yet? Well, there are actually a real financial objections, okay? <laughs> uh, and there are also, there are probably limiting beliefs, uh, objections. <laughs> so real financial objections is you cannot feed your family, okay? because you really don't have the money and you have to choose in between feeding your kids and paying for, for the program or paying your rent or paying for the program. That's one thing, okay? And, and then go to that. In the, your basic needs, like feeding your kids yep. and having a place to live is number one. Yep. But if it's not that, okay, and you are talking at a different level, we're talking about, well, you have to cut some things that you like 
like going for dinner or in a house or I call some other thing probably are not in the basic needs of eating or having a, a place to live. Okay. That for me is not a real life financial objections. That is a limiting belief 100%. that you cannot do it. Okay? Because there are so many ways. Uh, and let me give you an example. Uh, I started my first marketing company when I was 22 years old. And I did it with a hundred dollars, which is actually the hundred believers in Venezuelan currency. Okay. So they say it's a hundred dollars and a computer. That's how I started my business. And that business made millions of dollars. It's one, one of the top 10 companies in, in Venezuela at one point after only five years that I started that company. Okay. Um, when I started my market, uh, my um, multifamily private equity, and this is a funny story that probably some people can relate. Um, I had to pay for that um, $1,500 and I had to pay for that coaching program. And actually, uh, I didn't have any, let's say, financial limitation because or my husband had really doing well. Um, we had a, a beautiful house and food and everything on the table. But my husband didn't want me to pay for that coaching program. He was like, definitely not. That's so much money. You can learn by yourself. Like, just go and study. You're super smart. And I was like, I know that that is not the way. And I was like, this is the first time I love that I do not agree with you. And I actually <laughs> went and I paid for the coaching program. And I didn't tell him. And he was so mad. <laughs> he was so mad. And at that point, he was like, listen, okay, I'm not going to fund that. We are not going to use our savings to fund this company. Okay. And I, I had the coaching, okay, but then I didn't have any more money to put into the property. Later. So when I got my first property, I actually had to find a funding partner yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that can help me, that can help me to put the end money and all that. So I wouldn't say that I, I did have a financial objection because my husband didn't want to be part of the business, Perfect. okay? He didn't know. Now he's super happy. I have to, he's super happy right I now. Yeah. He invests in all the properties <laughs> that we buy. I mean, like we have depreciation. He's every year. He's like, okay, how much money are we saving in taxes this year? Yeah. And he is like, he doesn't understand them, but he's happy. Uh, but there are some objections that you 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 can actually find a way. And I would say that education, if you can do it. You, you have to go a hundred percent. I would have never do what I did if it wasn't because I pay for that coaching program. Yeah. That's yeah. not a hundred percent. That's a thousand percent. I can I can assure you that. Yeah, I put would, on your credit card. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Um, no, I would I would agree with you, and I think that that there's a, a big a, a big difference there between like uh you know are you really strapped or is it that you can't spend your whatever money on this xyz luxury that you are used to uh are used to enjoying now another thought that i have on this subject before we move on to ai because i really want to touch that subject um would be some of the best mentors that i've found in my career vanessa and i'm not sure if you can relate but some of the best mentors that i've found in my career have come from my network, meaning I have found people that are doing what I want to do that are connected to someone that I am close with, right? So like finding a friend of a friend, right? Who is doing exactly what you want to do and and leveraging that relationship, not like in a bad way, but simply saying like, hey, like, how do you know so-and-so? And can I get an introduction, right? And some of the best, in fact, one of my one of my hotel partners right now um, Sujay, he, uh, I literally found him on Instagram. I was like, dude, this guy is awesome. Like, how do I like, like, and then I saw, I had one connection with him and it turns out it was one of my best friends from my real estate brokerage. And so I said, dude, how do you know this guy? And he was like, oh, dude, that's like my, like basically my cousin, like they were like super close family friends. And so he made the introduction and then, you know, we, we just, hit it off right away and kind of created a, a, a relationship. And then I found a deal, brought it to him. And then that's how that all kind of happened. So it's, it's interesting that like, it doesn't always 
like mentorship and coaching doesn't always require money, right? Um, now I brought him the deal, right? So I br- there's some value exchange there, right? Because as I bring the, ba- the 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 deal, but it's interesting that you know we kind of get sucked up to the, into this idea that like there has to be like like a value exchange in form of money. That's not always right. the case. And if you are not able to, you know, invest into a coaching or a mentorship program, or you haven't found a coaching or a mentorship program that is right for you, then I, I would also say like you could potentially explore. And I'm not sure if you agree, but I, I think like uh, look searching through your network and seeing who's doing what I want to do and, and and how can I get connected to them is is almost just as powerful and sometimes even more powerful. Right. And I think one thing is not completely unrelated to the other mm-hmm. one because you're always finding people on the way that uh, you can give value to them because it's important to to think, okay, what value I or to this person? But everybody in your journey in some way or the other is going to act like a mentor. Mm-hmm. Okay, You know, um, Tony Robbins always say, there's people in your life that is in your life for a reason for a season or for a lifetime. Okay? Yeah. So everybody in your life come to your life for a reason, a season or a lifetime. Okay? Uh, so you think about that. Every person that you are connected to okay, has a lesson for you. Probably it's not going to be in your life forever. okay, But has a lesson for you, a message that you can hear or it's going to be for a season, okay, which could be, for example, a mentor okay, that is very important for, for a season or it's going to be for, with you for a lifetime, it's a long time, long time partner, or a husband or a wife, etc. So I think that everybody is around you for someone and can actually give you something, okay, and you can actually give them something as well. So it's like this intersectional oh, um, energy that actually is what is going to make the different one person's life or the other. And following in what you're saying, uh, you know, about the one degree of separation when everybody in some way or the other is connected to other person through a network of six people. Okay? Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting role and, and you can actually get to that person if you start seeing okay someone that you follow that follow that follows and you can get connected to them uh and i believe that one person actually can change the whole your whole life okay Mm -hmm. one person can actually change the whole trajectory of your life or your career the thing is that you don't know who is that person Mm -hmm. you don't know who is that person that is going to change your life so that, um, that's why it's so important to be open, to have eye open, ears open, okay? Uh, and, and just to see and listen, okay? Who is that person that the universe, God, or whoever is sending you to guide you uh, in, in the way? Again, could be a mentor, but could be also someone around you that you don't know where it's coming from. And I have many people that have changed my life Okay, and it's, it has been in my life for a reason or for a season that I can say that, okay, this person, and sometimes I don't remember the name of the person, but I know that this person <laughs> changed my whole life, okay? When I was 20, when I was 30, okay? Uh, and I, I, I also want to be one of those pers- people in other people's life. Okay? <laughs> like, I also think, like, how can I say something or do something that can actually, even if I'm not going to see this person again, I can actually help them. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and karma exists. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, um, no, I, I love that. And, and, uh, you know, I, I definitely have heard that, that Tony Robbins quote before and I think it's, uh, it's very true and, and, uh, that could just teach us everyone to just be mindful of of the relationships around you and and you know how you can impact them and vice versa. Moving forward, because I really want to talk about your views on AI, and you touched on it before. You're like, hey, like now you could just use you know ChatGPT or whatever to kind of uh, answer any questions that you might not know how, the answer to. And I think it's brilliant. You know, how do you see AI impacting the real estate syndic- syndication space? 
in 2024, let's just start with this year. Like, how do you see it impacting the syndication space and how can syndicators use AI technology today? Well, if you consider that we are in probably the most important year or two in the family uh, market in the last few decades, uh, and many, uh, many of the biggest indicators are talking about how important 2024 and 2025 are going to be to buy properties and what huge opportunity we're going to find. Okay. Um, if you consider that and you add to that, that's something incredibly huge and incredibly important is happen in life and this era which is the breakthrough of artificial intelligence okay and how artificial intelligence is changing and shaping many industries not only real estate but we're talking about healthcare okay medicine uh, every industry is touched by artificial intelligence and then you add the biggest opportunities to buy real estate or multifamily with the biggest breakthrough in history since fire and electricity and you put those together. If a syndicator can see the connection and do that, okay, they can make the biggest amount of money that a syndicator have ever made in real estate ever. Because it would be, let me explain you this and like, wait, let me put you this in a, in a, in a in a different industry. It would be like you find a FedEx office, okay? That is not a FedEx, but you find a FedEx office and you find the people that is managing that office, okay? Uh, they are not, they don't have computers, okay? So they are typing orders with a hand, high writing orders, and they don't have, uh, they deliver their mail and they receive the mail and then when they're going to deliver the mail they deliver the mail in horses instead of plane imagine that situation okay so you're at that fashion and then you come and say with technology okay and then you come and say hey i'm gonna buy this office FedEx office i'm gonna put a computer and i'm gonna deliver the mail in a plane what's gonna happen you just buy something in a low price, okay, because they don't know the value, then you put some technology and what happened? You increase the NOI, you make a lot of money with that. It's extremely well going to happen with multifamily and real estate if the operator understand how to use technology, how to use artificial intelligence and merge that uh, with multifamily and real estate, which has been for years and years a very traditional and, and very conservative okay, business. Yep. It has been completely old fashioned for years. And what it has been now, what what actually has been, uh, what actually has been using artificial intelligence yeah. for many years are all these companies that do, do predictive analytics like um, CoStar or Jardin Matrix, they use artificial intelligence. Yep. But also syndicators and people that are buying properties they don't know how to do it. And this has been our focus is, is to integrate these technologies to um, asset manager deals, to acquire our deals, to create broker relations, to find more deals, to streamline all these processes. But what is the bottom line? We use artificial intelligence and all new technology to find more deals, raise more capital, and actually increase the NOI of the properties. At the end, that's every that's yep. what you're looking for. <laughs> okay, it's like it's just a NOI, which is increase the NOI. And the only actually in I believe in 2025, okay, technology is gonna be the only thing that is gonna set the difference in between an operator that is making X amount of money and operators that is making way less money. Okay. Is going to be the use of technology. There is nothing else because you can control insurance costs. You cannot control taxes increases. Okay. 
but everything else in your expenses, everything else can be controlled with technology and with um, artificial intelligence. Okay. And, and I agree. I'm curious though, like give us one concrete example that you can think of right now on how AI is either currently or how you plan on having it impact your syndication business in 2024. Well, if we're talking about um, the deal per se, yeah. I can cut right now 50% of my payroll just using artificial intelligence. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. 50%, just right at the top. I got got 50% of my payroll if I use all the tools that I have, okay, all my buildings, okay. I don't need two or three employees to run a property. Uh-huh. And I believe the, the properties in the future are gonna, even if it's 200 apartments, are gonna be run just with maintenance, people that are taking care of the physical, uh, probably a few robots. Is it, is it? as well but what is actually the office okay i 100 percent believe that we are not gonna need human power and at least we're not gonna need the amount of human power that we need right now if i can cut 50 percent of my power my payroll right now <laughs> using artificial intelligence in two or three years probably we just have a robot that is able to talk to that human in the same way or better than a, a, a human is, is is talking to you right now. You know, you 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 just <laughs> you just touched on something, Vanessa, and I want to I really want to stick here for pretty much the remainder of the show because my belief is this: is that we saw a massive run up in prices and 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 equity gains over the last call it what fifteen years almost it's ever since the crash, like um like fifty. 13 years, right? And I, what I'm noticing and what I'm experiencing, what I'm seeing now is that, and I'll give you an example in the hotel world, CBRE uh, published a, a study done last year where top line revenues had increased or the uh, top line revenues had increased pretty significantly um, in 2023. However, however, re- uh, margins were down, right? So what does that mean? Well, that means expenses are, cl- are climbing at a faster rate than than revenues are. And so what you just said, I think everyone who is an experienced investor, or even if you're new, you should take this nugget. The key to being a successful investor in the 2020s and the 2030s will have everything to do with managing and controlling expenses. Have everything to do with that. And how do you manage and control? How do you manage and control expenses? That's exactly the point. Right. The only way to manage and control expenses is while well, having a good asset manager, Usually. watching in your uh, T12, watching in your utilities, putting blah, blah, blah. Really, okay. The only way to control expenses is with technology. Having 100%. all that data, uh, having the data, having um, all of these um, smart buildings, okay smart buildings uh, with internet of things matched with artificial intelligence, okay. uh, cutting your um, payroll expenses because you don't need actually someone okay, sitting on your desk answering the phone okay, just to call people to book tours. <laughs> you don't need that anymore. Right. Okay, That's artificial intelligence. So why would you Put that into your even if you 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 are very efficient watching at your at your T12. Okay, technology is the only thing that is going to set a different. And at one point, I believe that all of the properties would be wrong uh, with technology, but it's gonna it's gonna take time because people sure. right now, even right now, and even people that I know in the industry is is so concerned about the using of of these technologies. People. People don't like change. People don't like change. And they're concerned about, you said they're concerned how people is going to react to the use of that. Okay. Uh, so they just sit and wait. And while everybody's sitting and waiting, I am putting all that into my properties and I am making more money than everybody else. <laughs> well, and, and, and by the way, 
that also is great for your investors because by, through implementing AI, you're increasing the operational efficiency of your business and your properties, which ultimately is going to lead to better returns. And and I think that the the only surefire way to guarantee greater than normal returns, you know, uh, uh, superior returns is going to be through operational efficiencies and excellence and not necessarily in terms of like, hey, how are we going to drive revenue uh, on the top line? Because that will take care of itself over time, but we can no longer really rely on the run-up that we just experienced over like the last 13 years. I think that's a pretty, that's a pretty unique scenario that we experienced over the last 13 years. And I think this next cycle, it's going to be even more important to watch those, um, to watch those expense items. And, and you just hit it on the head, Vanessa, you're, you're with AI. I think that there's a lot of uh, potential there to, to improve operational efficiencies. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and also adding to that, that for the next year or two, uh, you will probably see in some states and some cities negative rent growth. Mm. You're not be able to increase rents yep. like you did it last year or the last two years. So the only way would be, as you say, optimizing uh, those expenses. You need to get as creative, creative as you can in in the uh, and technology is the key for success. In, uh, and artificial intelligence is general because it's such new and there is so many uses right now that you didn't have a year ago. A year ago, there are so many things that you couldn't do that you are able to do right now okay. to improve the efficiencies and the operation of your business in general. And that's what I say exactly what you said, Danny, is what I say to my investors. Okay, My investors, they don't care about AI. Nobody cares about AI. What they care is like what I'm doing to improve the operations and how what I'm doing in so they are making more money. Okay. Sure. And that's also for my tenants. My tenants, they don't care about AI. They don't care how I I, I, I run the operations as far as they are way taken care. Uh, they they feel that they get the attention that they need. We take care of their uh, maintenance requests. And their apartments are good. They, they, they apart, the building okay, is well taken care. Like AI is, is just, the vehicle okay, mm -hmm. to do that, to have good tenants and happy tenants and have happy investors. Okay. That I think that's a very good summary. <laughs> Why would you say, I used to have happy tenants and happy investors. <laughs> so a hundred percent. I I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense because you're, um, you're improving the, the experience for the tenants. You're also improving the returns for the investors. We're coming up on time, Vanessa. I want to be respectful of your time. And there's a question that I, I really wanted to ask you, and I feel like we're probably not going to have t enough time to go super deep on this, but why is this the most important 24 month stretch for real estate investors in the multifamily space? Why is that? Well, we have, first of all, we're coming from the best years in real estate and the market is, is, is a cycle. Okay. Everything comes up and down at one point. And we have been in a seller's market for a long time, for a long time. And now since 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021, we were at the top of the prices and everybody came with this great idea of buying these properties in a bridge loan okay? and <laughs> over leverage. Yep the properties for 80 and 90% and having bridge loans just for the sake of having bridge loans so they can raise less money. Um, those, all those loans are coming due <laughs> and they're, all those loans are coming to maturity and people right now, there is a lot of properties that needs to be sold. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's number one. Not mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I see uh, that there is a lot of loans that are going to mature even for fixed rate. Okay. So you're going to see a lot of um, large operators or they're going to see uh, people that own those properties like mom and pop owns those properties for 10, 20 years. Okay. They are concerned about the recession. So mom and pop uh, owners 
are very concerned about the recession because the recession, everybody's talking about the recession is coming, okay? Uh, and something is going to happen in the economy, which, by the way, I don't agree. <laughs> I just came back from Canada uh, for five days. It was a very in-depth financial event when, I mean, it was a very small master mastermind and we had people like Ray Dalio and Warren Buffett talking to us. And they are all very... Uh, consciousness okay about the economy everybody has a different point of view of what's going to happen but they are not stop investing okay they are not freezing right now and they're all uh, we we had probably 20 different speakers in that for those 20 uh for those five days and they are all still investing in real estate now one of the things that they all agree is that multifamily uh rental properties okay are a very safe investment even right now okay we we cover everything we cover stock market indexes cryptocurrency we cover everything because it was about diversification and how you can also diversify your money but everybody agrees that real estate investment properties are and especially multifamily is the safest way to invest right now so um just the fact that all these loans are going to mature and you can see that the cap rates are now not that compressed mm-hmm. as it was before. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, last year, we, our underwriting team analyzed more than 850 deals. Oh, wow. And we saw that the gap in between our price and what they wanted or how they went into contract, it was about 25 to 30% gap. So we were willing to pay 25, 30% below of what they're actually selling those deals. Right now, for the last three months in the year, since December to uh, January and February, we actually see a difference of 10% in between our price and what auditor is willing to pay. So you can see that that gap is closing right now and it's going to close more and at the end of, of 2024, as those loans mature okay, and people get more scared, and that's the time when people start, they're gonna, they're gonna be a lot of deals in the market that needs to be sold, and you, you, you have the availability, you have the time right now, and you have the opportunity to buy deals that are 15%, 25% below price. You have properties that are below replacement value mm-hmm. right now and that's gonna keep going right. i think in 2024 and 2025 yeah that is um i mean it, it's so true that the 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 market conditions right now uh, there's especially when it comes to the maturing loans uh there are so many properties that i've seen personally where it's like it would cost way more to build this thing from scratch than you guys are selling this for right now, which is which is crazy to think, right? Like, so what you just said right now, below replacement value, who knows when the next time that's going to happen is? Uh, but this is a, a once in a, a once in a cycle opportunity, and I could not agree more. Vanessa, uh, thank you so much for your time. I know that we're up on time here. If you want to learn more about Vanessa's coaching program or just connect with Vanessa, all of the links to connect with her are going to be in this, this the description box down below. And Vanessa, in traditional goldmine fashion, before I let you go, I'm going to let you leave the audience with one final gold nugget. Okay. So if you are an entrepreneur, okay, regardless of which industry you are, okay. uh, there is this book that I started reading a few um, weeks ago that I love and it's called um, Buy Back Your Time, okay? Right. And it's all full of golden nuggets, okay? This is like full of golden nuggets of how you can build your business and actually scale your business faster. And what I do is I take those concepts and I actually add technology to the concepts, okay? Mm-hmm. So AI, I was like, I, I can go and use AI and how I do the bad using AI. And then the AI comes to me and tell me how can I do it? <laughs> nice. So um, that that if you're a syndicator or if you're even in a, not a different business, okay, or even if you are um, running a different type of company, I think this book is, is awesome and it's full of golden nuggets. 
That's awesome. And it's called Buy Back Your Time, yeah? Buy Back Your Time from Dan, Dan Martell. Buy Back Your Time from Dan Martell. That's awesome. Vanessa, thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Bye-bye.